Hi, welcome to Design for Entrepreneurs. I'm Heather and I made this video for my fellow classmates at the Halcyon Incubator. But if, like us, you're trying to launch your own business, welcome aboard. My hope is that this presentation will give you a few basic principles of design to assist you with developing your venture's brand, conveying your ideas visually, and creating more professional, polished presentations. Let's get started. First things first, this may seem random, but grab a pen and some paper. I want you to do two things. First, write down three words to describe your venture. What do you do? Sum it up in only three distinct words. Second, write down three words describing how you want your venture to be perceived by your clients, by the general public. Think ahead five years when your venture is an established company. How do you want people to feel when they hear Ecoviate or Memonatu Magazine or Student Language Exchange? Think about that and come up with three words to describe that public perception, because it's up to you to craft that perception before someone else does. This may seem weird, but believe me, it plays a big part in design. Because, what is design? Simply put, design is communication. It's a language all its own. Design is a tool to shape perception, to evoke feeling, to tell a story, your story. If you don't think about it, if you don't plan for it, your venture and your message will look garbled and incomplete. So where to begin? Personally, I like to begin with color schemes. What's a color scheme? You may not fully realize it yet, but you already know. If you've shopped at Ikea, you know a color scheme. Swipe a MasterCard and ta-da, four colors. They got all fancy and complicated. The most recognizable brand in the world, Coca-Cola, gets by with just red and white. Yes, even the Halcyon Incubator has a color scheme. Oh, and uh, so does this presentation. Every successful company has a color scheme. You need one too. It will shape and impact all of your decisions around branding, design, and marketing. I see it as a vital first step because color will inform all of your future design choices. Which brings us back to your three words describing your venture and its perception. Those word sets can be used to inspire and inform your color scheme. Different colors have been proven to affect people in different ways. Some people take that a bit far. For instance, when George Washington built Mount Vernon, he deliberately painted every single dining room green because he thought that would somehow aid in digestion. Color may not help your tummy process food better, but it can change someone's emotional state or subliminal perceptions. Red evokes optimism, heat, and love. Orange is warmth, vibrance. It's sunrises and sunsets. Yellow is sunshine, happiness, ease, and freedom from fear. Green is clearly associated with wealth, the earth, and interestingly, childhood. It's the most often cited favorite color of children, especially boys. Blue, my personal favorite, evokes opportunity, calm, and wisdom. It's a sky of limitless horizons or a wide open sea. Interesting tidbit. Throughout human history, in nearly every single language on Earth, blue is the very last of all the main colors to receive a name. Weird, huh? It's true. Go back and read the Odyssey and you'll find that Homer described the sea as wine dark. There's still a tribe in Africa today that doesn't have a word for blue, but they have 14 words for green. Anyway, purple is the original color of royalty, but interestingly, as a mix of red and blue, it evokes a mix of each color's impact, an optimistic opportunity, a stable, long-lasting love. Pink is a similar combination color evoking red and white. Speaking of white, neutrals evoke feeling too. White is the color of clarity, purity, and innocence. Black shows depth, stability, and seriousness. It's an excellent grounding color, but it takes skill to use it as a primary color, especially as a background. Colors clearly have an emotional dictionary. Use it. Now go back to your three words. What words did you come up with? How do they correlate to the feelings listed here? It's a good place to start. Choosing that one initial color is a starting point, a springboard to help you find coordinating colors that come together to form a cohesive, complementary, evocative palette 
that helps describe your venture and evoke strong feelings in reaction to it. Now that you're on your way to picking colors, let's go over some simple tips on how to use them. First and foremost, always balance pops of bold color with neutrals. Think of your bold colors as neon flags, tools to direct your reader's eye to where you want it to go first. With my own venture, Newsies, I want people to notice our name first, not our slogan. But if I were to throw color everywhere in a pattern that makes no real sense, both the name and the slogan lose their impact. Why? Because if you put too many bold colors together at once, it's confusing to the human brain. Your eye simply won't know where to settle. Clean, careful usage of color is more impactful and especially helpful when dealing with large amounts of text. So be careful where you use those neon flag colors. Next up, create a consistent pattern of use. Throughout all of my Newsies materials, I've stuck with the idea of a balance between blue and green. I always start with blue before green, then occasionally swap to green before blue. The thing is, I keep it consistent. That's another reason why this looks particularly out of place. At least it does to me. If you ever find yourself stuck wishing you had more colors in your scheme, don't worry, because you can always play with gradients. The Newsies color scheme may seem limited with only three colors, but those three colors are hiding a world of possibilities. Simply change their brightness levels and you'll instantly have more than enough options. Take your colors brighter and darker. See what works, what doesn't. It's an easy way to keep things consistent, yet varied enough to add a little spice and help to direct the eye. Just don't go too crazy with it. If you still need a little help, there are lots of helpful tools and tricks to get you started. First, look to nature. It's incredibly rare to see a beautiful vista or a natural flower bed and ever see clashing colors. Use a color select tool, grab colors you like, and see how they mesh together. Color.adobe.com is amazing. So amazing, I have to show it to you. It's basically a free giant color wheel that you can drag around and it'll instantly show you four additional corresponding colors. You can even choose different methodologies for how they choose those four other colors. Then they all show up instantly complete with HTML hex codes, which are the codes that guide you through the universe of color. How awesome is that? All those options based on just one color in the middle. Not every option will be a winner, but it's a great way to find inspiration. Anyway. Back to more helpful tools. When all else fails, Google for pre-made color scheme sites. There are several good ones out there, but a word of caution, please stay away from colors that are at all muddy or dirty looking, please, it's a pet peeve of mine. If you use Mac widgets, I've seen some good color schemes in Color Schemer Galleria. Lastly, I would like to introduce the Lords of Color Science, Pantone. Have you ever wondered how each season so many different stores and products all come out in the exact same set of colors? It's Pantone's fault. They do intensive scientific studies to figure out which colors most appeal to each culture at any given time. Then they release color trend books, which then pretty much everyone follows. It's like color dictatorship, but they're just so good at it. That said, I tend to stay away from anything too trendy since it'll date your venture but it's a good place to go for inspiration. Now with colors out of the way, it's on to typography, one of my personal favorites. The importance of typography cannot be understated. It's the subtle yet powerful strategic choice that will elevate your venture to the next level. Fonts change any words, impact, tone, and definition. To give you an idea of what I mean, no one with any tact or professionalism would ever make a joke about Ebola, yet choose the wrong font, and suddenly you're the jerk cracking inappropriate jokes. Choose the wrong font and the wrong color, and well, it no longer matters what you were trying to say, because the visual cues you just gave said the exact opposite and have completely changed the other person's perception of you and what you just said. Think of fonts as the visual equivalent of your tone of voice. Even the nicest, sweetest words sound hateful if you shout them. It changes what you just said, so be thoughtful and strategic when choosing your visual tone of voice, your fonts. 
So let's break it down. Basically speaking, fonts are broken into two types, serif and sans serif. Basically, serif is a name for the little wings and fiddly bits at the edges of letters. What we think of as the modern serif font was actually designed in the 15th century by Johann Gutenberg with the goal of improving the readability of large chunks of text. That's why most books are typically in serif typefaces. Sans serif, however, has been thought to be more easily readable on computer monitors, which is why websites tend to be in sans serif. But that's starting to fade. That was originally due to lower resolution monitors, but in the age of high definition it's not really an issue anymore, but has become a bit of a tradition. Naturally, there are many fonts outside the realm of serif versus sans serif. I'll try to sum up the wide array of fonts in four categories. First, calligraphy. Typically harder to read, but very pretty. Titling, traditionally used as decorative first letters at the start of a chapter or a long segment of text. Stylized, which is kind of a catch-all. It can cover anything from handwritten to thematic to even a period in time. Lastly, my favorite trick of the trade, dingbats. Funny name and super helpful. They're essentially just vector graphics assigned to letters. I think they tend to be a little higher quality design-wise than clip art and much less heavily used. Plus, you can find a dingbat with just about anything from arrows to objects, people to graphs, text bubbles to pop culture icons. My best advice for typography is to begin by choosing two fonts. Think of it as one font with personality for your logo and one for pure readability. One attention-grabbing neon flag type font, one for all your bulk text. Once you have your fonts chosen, use those and only those. Just as important, again, refer to your three words. Find fonts that evoke those words that describe your venture and your desired perception. But always, always be mindful of maintaining a feeling of professionalism. I'll use Newsies as an example of what I mean. I struggled for a long, long time to find and choose this font. I wanted to find a font that would both appeal to children and teachers, express a sense of fun, and evoke print journalism in some way. I feel like this was a pretty good choice to meet those needs, but it needed to be grounded. I went a little bit childish, so I chose a more professional serif font for our slogan to serve as a visual and subconscious grounding foundation. Good design, much like anything else, is about finding balance, the yin and the yang, the black and the white. Every visual cue needs to be countered and balanced to provide a cohesive, deliberate look. I ended up helping another Halcyon classmate, Ari Raz, rework his logo to address the same issue. Much like my venture, Pure Joy is all about kids, baby food to be precise. What's more fun than designing for babies? Their slogan originally looked like this, but they didn't seem to get much traction with it. We sat down one day to go over it, and I realized it lacked balance in two, possibly even three respects. Can you guess why? Both the colors and typefaces are conflicting with each other. You should always want your eye to go to the name of your venture first. Even if you have two colors as Newsies does, you want them to work together to draw the eye toward the name. The green of pure joy, perfect as a gender neutral color for babies, should be the only pop of color in this instance. But the color isn't the only problem. The typeface for pure joy already evokes the joy of childhood, but so does the different typeface for the slogan. There's nothing there to convey the sense of a, of a professional business. Pure joy may make food for babies, but babies aren't the ones buying it. Pure joy has to convince the parents to buy their food, and parents prefer buying baby food from people who know what they're doing people they can trust. So we made a change. As far as logo changes go, this was pretty minor, but I think it made a significant difference. A simple stroke to evoke a smile and a clean, crisp, professional typeface to ground the business in professionalism and stability. This also brings up a third potential issue. Good design is also about repetition whenever possible. A choice looks more deliberate, less random, when it's repeated and balanced against itself. It isn't always possible or even necessary, but it's a good rule of thumb. In this case, we repeated the color in the black outline around pure joy, 
balancing out that design choice and making it look more purposeful, strategic, and deliberate. Not a bad overall upgrade from just a few simple implementations of basic design principles. So how do you get started? Choose two fonts. Make sure when both choosing them and implementing them that you always strive for balance. Make sure you have one font for catching the eye and another for bulk printed text. It doesn't matter if it's serif or sans serif, so long as it's readable. I went with a serif to evoke print journalism. But if you're a company like Autolith Sound or Sanovation, all about science and innovation, a sans serif might be better for you. Play with kerning. What's kerning? It's the space between each letter. It's a handy and beautiful trick that not many people play with. Lastly, whatever you choose, create patterns of use and stick to it. Again, it's all about repetition and balance, making you look more deliberate and strategic in your decision making. Again, there are lots of helpful tools and tricks out there. First, look to successful companies, your competitors, your idols, and your overall market. What do they use? What trends exist? What trends are so trendy that you might want to consider avoiding them? How can you both look the part you want to play while standing out? Next, check out fonts.google.com. Google, being Google, have made themselves the gods of web typography. That site has an ever-growing collection of fonts which can be easily embedded into your websites with a single line of code. It's a great way to get a more customized look without sacrificing load times. I always always start there. If you need a more stylized logo or eye-catching font, I wouldn't necessarily use something there just because it'll be more widely used, but it's fantastic for your bulk font choice since you can then make your typefaces consistent across both your print materials and your website. That gives you an extra added bump up in the world of design, cohesion, and professionalism. Next, free font sites. There are tons of them. Go searching and find that one font that looks like it was made just for you. Personally, I love Defont.com. They have tons, have them well categorized, are always adding more, and I've never gotten a virus from them. Need inspiration? Go to sites like WeLoveTypography.com. They don't focus on logos, but they do feature tons of beautifully laid out type in a bunch of different styles that can hopefully inspire you and get you looking in directions you might not have otherwise considered. For Mac heads, there's a great little widget called Fontsy. It's a great way to quickly browse through your font collection. So now you're on your way to getting your color scheme and your cohesive typefaces. The next big step is how to use them. Layout. You have so much you want to say and show. You have the colors and typefaces to help you do that, but there's one more vital step, how you arrange them. Even the best color schemes and content can be handicapped by bad layout. Layout is simply all about managing space and balance. It's spatial awareness in a two-dimensional universe. My favorite rule of thumb is to think about each object like a person as if it were you. Are you most comfortable when everybody's crowded right up against you? Or like most people, do you prefer a little bit of personal space? The first step of understanding layout is really that simple. Simple spatial awareness and comfort. Let's take the same idea and apply it to text. Here's some random newsies text for you. This is way too much verbiage for a PowerPoint presentation, but I wanted to show you enough text to give you an idea of spacing. Notice this text is way too bunched up. I've seen this in a lot of printed text and in PowerPoint presentations. It looks cramped. It feels cramped. It makes the reader uncomfortable. It takes away from the impact the logo could have and the readability of the text below it. Look at what a difference it makes if we simply give it some breathing room and align the text instantly a lot better and more readable, but it could be even better. Again, one of your biggest goals with design should be to make things appear deliberate rather than random. Right now, that text is not centered. It's not even in a position where it could be considered properly asymmetrical. It's just random. One slight change, and now it could be considered appropriately deliberately laid out. It looks more comfortable, more familiar. Why? because it's balanced. 
It's the same distance from the left as it is from the top. That is now properly laid out in a balanced yet asymmetrical fashion. It's no longer random, but deliberate. Space and balance are the easiest tools to help you create a comfortable, deliberate layout. Figure out how you want to find balance, then create patterns of usage. Notice how throughout this presentation, headers always appear in the same general location in the same style. Your eye becomes trained and knows where to look now. When additional bulk text is needed, it appears in the same uniform patterns making it easier to read. That's layout. That's all it is. Space, balance, and repetition. There are a few tricks of the trade that you can use to help with layout specifically. First, the rule of threes. The human eye is trained to appreciate and find beauty in segments of three. How many shapes are on that screen right now? I didn't do that by accident. There may be an uneven number, yet to the human brain there is balance and beauty in threes. We can apply that to layout the same way photographers apply it to their craft. Take a blank canvas and imagine it split into thirds. This is your first set of layout guidelines. If you lay out your materials to in some way correspond with these three segments, you'll be good to go. As an example, you could center your header on the left and center your text on the right, but there are lots of ways to play with that to break it down even further. Add horizontal thirds as well, until you end up with nine blocks in a grid. That grid is one possible guide to perfect layout. Right now it may just look like blocks, but lay that grid over the top of some of the world's most famous images, and you'll start to see it everywhere. Ansel Adams was great with the rule of threes, yet without that grid, it just looks like a nice landscape. Leonardo da Vinci was the master of applying mathematics to fine art. Practically all of his works from the simplest sketch to his greatest masterpieces fit in perfectly with principles of mathematics and design. Thinking of more modern art forms, have you ever wondered why actors in movies are always filmed off-center? You can thank the rule of threes. It's everywhere, from Star Wars to Psycho to the Ten Commandments to Batman. Every movie, for as long as they've been around, if they're visually appealing, they stick to this principle. Your layout should be no different, because it applies to everything. Yes, even websites like Amazon.com. Your layout design can do the same thing. It doesn't always have to be exact, but thinking in terms of threes can do you a world of good. Interestingly, the rule of threes applies to words, too. If you list three things, the fourth will be forgotten. Study after study has shown that the human brain can pick up three direct things at a time, but rarely any more. After that, things start to get a little fuzzy. I made this mistake early on with Newsies, listing all of the types of media that our class newspapers could be based on. By about the third item, people's eyes would start to glaze over. They not only couldn't remember past the third, but they lost interest. Don't make that mistake. Hit three main points, then move on. Because after that, what you say won't matter anyway, because it's not going to stick. The last tool I'll give you on layout is my personal favorite. The golden ratio. This mathematical principle was first discovered by a great dude named Fibonacci. Normally I hate math since I'm dyscalculic, but this math makes sense to me. It's art in numbers. The golden ratio is simply that every one inch is perfectly balanced against 1.618 of an inch. That doesn't look very pretty there, but in nature, it's everywhere. That shell is a perfect representation of 1 to 1.618. Roses are perfect examples of 1 to 1.618. Human bodies are covered in the golden ratio too. To demonstrate, let's play with my golden ratio calipers. Yes, I'm not much of a nerd. <laughs> this little gizmo is awesome because no matter how far you extend it, it will always maintain a perfect golden ratio of 1 to 1.618. So let's start with the human hand because it's chock full of the golden ratio. More often than not, the width of your palm is precisely 1.618 times the length of your thumb. The length of your fingers typically fits the golden ratio too. The face is full of golden awesomeness, especially the lips. 
your bottom lip is typically 1.618 times the height of your top lip. Cool how that works, huh? Not everyone's going to be perfectly proportioned all the time, but more often than not, people that we consider beautiful are going to be near perfect representations of the golden ratio. Kate Moss is covered in it. The width of her eye is 1.618 times the distance of her eye from her nose. The width of her mouth is 1.618 times the width of her eye, and so on and so forth. If you think something's beautiful, chances are you're seeing the golden ratio. So how do you use the golden ratio? Simple. You use this map to achieve perfect layout and design. This diagram shows an ever-growing, ever-expanding ratio of 1 to 1.618. The outer edges show a rectangle broken down into 1 to 1.618. It is then repeated again and again at different angles within the rectangle, filling in the shape perfectly with no wasted space. Those repeated rectangles then form a perfect spiral, which is seen throughout nature, in seashells, roses, the center of sunflowers, hurricanes, galaxies, and so much more. Use it and it will pay off for you. I used it as a starting point for this presentation. The height of my header is 1.618 times how far it is from the top of the screen. That's simply one example out of many how you can use the golden ratio to your advantage. Can't figure out the scale of your logo? Play with the golden ratio. Don't know how big your text should be in relation to an image? Play with the golden ratio. It will always give you a workable, beautiful answer. As always, some helpful tools to get you started. Golden Ratio templates, just like the ones I just showed in this presentation. Google Golden Ratio Rectangle and use it as a guideline. You'll be surprised how many ways in which you can use it creatively. If you're stuck and want to figure out the Golden Ratio for something specific, download the Mac Widget Ficulator. It's free and simple. You can simply enter any number and it will tell you precisely what that number's Golden Ratio is. I use it way too much, but it always pays off. If you're stuck on a layout and don't know where to start, don't be afraid to use free templates, whether it's for PowerPoint presentations, brochures, business cards, or whatever. But please don't use them as a crutch. Use them as a foundation. Use it as a starting line, then put your own twist on it. Add your own branding, and as always, be consistent. I highly recommend buying a pair of golden gauge calipers. They're great for eyeballing things. I found mine at a quilting store for $6.99. If you want to nerd out with me, the link's in the description. Lastly, trust your gut. If something doesn't look right, change it. We're surrounded by the golden ratio and its beauty every single day. You know what you personally find beautiful, and now you know why and what to look for. Emulate what you like. Emulate those you idolize. Fake it till you make it. Now, the final segment. Just a few final tidbits on PowerPoint. First off, I don't care what set as the default option, you must, must always use widescreen. You're only ever going to present on a widescreen anyway. Besides, if your presentation is stuck in the display dark ages, you're losing a lot of valuable space to pointless black bars. That's just silly. Ah, oh, that's better. Oh, we went over typography, but it's especially important for PowerPoint. When you're designing your slides, you're right up close to your monitor, but please keep in mind your audience will be much farther away. Average font sizes might look fine to you, but to your audience sitting 10 feet away, tiny fonts will be completely unreadable. It's an unforced error that will completely disconnect your audience from what you're saying. Bigger is simply easier for everyone. If at all possible, test your presentation on a TV before you actually present it. Sit in the very last row and honestly ask yourself if you can read your text. If not, go bigger. Next up, the best advice I ever got on PowerPoint. I luckily got to meet Jeff Hoffman, the founder of Priceline. He told me simply, just tell your story. Don't give a presentation. Instead, just talk and tell a story. Try giving your pitch with no slides at all for practice. When you can tell your story smoothly, with each slide logically leading into the next, you've got it made. That deceptively simple advice radically changed my approach to PowerPoint. 
It changed the way I structured my entire deck and solved so many problems, especially for my demo day presentation. Please don't use slides as a crutch. Use them to help emphasize the story you'd tell if you didn't even have PowerPoint. Let's explore a real world example of this point by playing a little game of Bill Gates versus Steve Jobs. One man invented PowerPoint and another man perfected it. The Microsoft presentation is cluttered. With so much going on, your eye has no idea where to look first. Contrast that with Steve Jobs. Everything about that presentation is focused. Focused on Steve Jobs. He's just telling a story. There's one key fact or key product behind him at any given time. Nothing more. Bill Gates is sadly letting PowerPoint tell the story for him. Steve Jobs is the story. I never thought I'd say this in my entire life, but don't make the same mistake as Bill Gates. Sorry, Mr. Gates. Too many people make the mistake of pulling a Bill Gates and filling their presentations with lots of big important charts with lots and lots of data, thinking that makes them look impressive. Steve Jobs wouldn't do that. Steve Jobs knows that while you're trying to talk, your audience is busy trying to decipher a chart from 10 feet away. They're so distracted and confused they have no idea what you're saying, and you have completely lost them. Congratulations, your audience is now gone. Don't do that. Instead, do what Steve does. Save that graph for a booklet. For your presentation, whittle that chart down to your most important metric. Again, think back to the rule of threes. No one's going to remember everything on that chart anyway. They're only going to remember how confused they were. Ask yourself, what's the one key fact you want stuck in their brain? The answer to that question is what goes in your presentation. It is sometimes unavoidable that you will have slides with a decent amount of information on them. Here's a good example from my own presentation. In this slide, I walk people through the idea for my venture, Newsies, which is all about easy custom newspaper publication purpose built for the classroom. With Newsies, an individual teacher can create their own custom online class newspaper where kids become columnists reporting from inside their favorite stories. This is a lot of information and a lot of going on visually, but careful use of animations allows me to walk you through it step by step, keeping it from being overwhelming. If instead I had just put all of this up on the screen at once, everybody in the audience would be trying to decipher it and reading ahead rather than actually listening to me. If you have to have this much going on, do it sparingly and be very thoughtful about it. Use animations to your benefit so that people are following along with you rather than skipping ahead and getting confused. If it gets to the point where it's still too much or you have a graph you really, really want people to see, there's still a way to do that. With handouts. Handouts leave lasting impressions. Your presentation is bigger than the slides you create. The impression you'll leave on people is dependent upon more than those few minutes when you're actually up there presenting. Don't waste an opportunity and don't neglect the people who have come to hear you. Make sure that from the minute they walk in that door, they know that you've put thought into their entire experience. A handout is a great way to do that and make sure that you get vital information into their hands. For my presentation handouts, I always have three key factors. A brochure, complete with consistent branding and messaging. A business card, and just as important but often neglected, a handwritten thank you. It doesn't have to be complicated. All I did was a little piece of paper that said thank you for coming. The people who come to your pitches are very busy people. They're taking time out of their schedules for you, to help you, to hear you. They deserve to be thanked for it. Do so at the very beginning, and I guarantee you it will change their perception of your entire presentation. And of course, don't forget to mail proper handwritten thank you notes afterward. Thank you notes and other social niceties are a dying art, but they are much appreciated and are long remembered. I want to leave you with one final word. Edit. We all spend just about every minute of every day thinking about our ventures. It's all consuming for us. There's so much going on, so much we're so eager to share, but our enthusiasm can sometimes be overwhelming for others. We entrepreneurs can often end up with a bad case of verbal diarrhea, which can very easily turn into visual design diarrhea. We can't ever, ever forget to edit, 
Take a step back and remove at least one thing. When all else fails, remember to kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Simplicity is beautiful, but more importantly, simple is memorable. And you always want to make sure that you and your adventure will be remembered. Thank you, and happy designing.